Do your thing. Hello, guys. Hello. Today we're reading Chapter 11, Quidditch. Oof. Probably should have scrubbed up on that Quidditch book, eh? Okay. Alright, we'll dive straight in, because I haven't even posted the last chapter yet, so there's no comments or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Very fast turnaround this time. You're welcome. <laughs> Alrighty. <clears throat> As they entered November, the weather turned very cold. Ooh. Not here. Yeah. The cold mountains around the school became icy grey and the lake like chilled steel. Every morning the ground was covered in frost. Hagrid could be seen from the upstairs windows to frosting broomsticks on the Quidditch pitch, bundled up in long moleskin overcoat, rabbit fur gloves, and enormous beaver skin boots. The Quidditch season had begun. On Saturday, Harry would be playing in his first match after weeks of training. Gryffindor versus Slytherin. If Gryffindor won, they would move up into second place in the house championship. Hardly anyone had seen Harry play, because Wood had decided that, as their secret weapon, Harry should be kept secret. But the news that he was playing Seeker had leaked out somehow, and Harry didn't know which was worse. People telling him he'd be brilliant, or people telling him they'd be running around underneath him, holding a mattress. It was really lucky that Harry now had Hermione as a friend. He didn't know how he'd have got through all his homework without her. What with all the last-minute Quid Quidditch practice, Wood was making them do. She had also lent him Quidditch Through the Ages, which turned out to be a very interesting read. Harry learnt that there were 700 ways of committing a Quidditch foul, and that all of them had happened during a World War... Oh, oh whoops... I'll go back. Harry had learnt that there were 700 ways of committing a Quidditch foul, and that all of them had happened during a World Cup match in 1473, that Seekers were usually the smallest and fastest players, and the most serious Quidditch accidents seemed to happen to them, that although people rarely died playing Quidditch, referees had been known to vanish and turn up months later in the Sahara Desert. Every time I watched the movie, I was like, if I was a Seeker, I would be really scared to catch that because it has like little wings like it would hurt yeah, yeah it would have like cuts my hand i don't know like... harry's got like gloves true yeah they're like fingerless though mm. so yeah like i don't know i always thought maybe like i have to get it like this maybe the <laughs> silver's like so fine that it just feels like feathers like maybe it doesn't actually hurt maybe yeah Hermione had become a bit more relaxed about breaking rules since Harry and Ron had saved her from the mountain troll, and she was much nicer for it. The day before Harry's first Quidditch match, the three of them were out in the freezing courtyard during break, and she had conjured them up a bright blue fire, which could be carried around in a jam jar. They were standing with their backs to it, getting warm, when Snape crossed the yard. Harry noticed at once that Snape was limping. Harry, Ron, and Hermione moved closer together to block the fire from view. They were sure it wasn't allowed. Unfortunately, something about their guilty faces caught Snape's eye. He limped over. He hadn't seen the fire, but he seemed to be looking for a reason to tell them off anyway. What's that you've got there, Potter? It was Quidditch through the ages. Harry showed him. Library books are not to be taken outside the school, said Snape. Give it to me. Five points from Gryffindor. Yeah, there goes the troll points. He's just made that rule up, Harry muttered angrily as Snape limped away. Wonder what's wrong with his leg. Dunno, but I hope it's really hurting him, said Ron bitterly. The Gryffindor common room was very noisy that evening. Harry, Ron, and Hermione sat together next to a window. Hermione was checking Harry and Ron's charms homework for them. She would never let them copy. How will you learn? But by asking her to read it through, they got the right answers anyway. Harry felt restless. He wanted Quidditch through the ages back, to take his mind off his nerves about tomorrow. Why should he be afraid of Snape? Getting up, he told Ron and Hermione how he was going to ask Snape if he could have it. Rather you than me, they said together. But Harry had an idea that Snape wouldn't refuse if there were other teachers listening. He made his way down to the staff room and knocked. There was no answer. He knocked again. Nothing. Perhaps Snape had left the book in there. It was worth a try. He pushed the door ajar and peered inside, and a horrible scene met his eyes. 
Snape and Filch were inside alone. Bit spicy. Snape <laughs> was holding his robes above his knees. One of his legs was bloody and mangled. Filch was ba- was handing Snape bandages. Blasted thing, Snape was saying. How are you supposed to keep your eyes on all three heads at once? Harry tried to shut the door quietly, but... Potter! Snape's face was twisted with fury as he dropped his robes quickly to hide his leg. Harry gulped. I just wondered if I could have my book back. Get out! Out! Harry left. Before Snape could take any more points from Gryffindor, he sprinted back upstairs. Did you get it? Ron asked as Harry joined them. What's the matter? In a low whisper, Harry told them he'd, what he'd seen. You know what this means, he finished breathlessly. He tried to get past that three-headed dog at Halloween. That's where he was going when we saw him. He's after whatever it's guarding, and I'd bet my broomstick he let that troll in, to create a diversion. Hermione's eyes were wide. No, he wouldn't, she said. I know he's not very nice, but he wouldn't try and steal something Dumbledore was keeping safe. Honestly, Hermione, you think all teachers are saints or something, snapped Ron. I'm with Harry. I wouldn't put anything past Snape. But what's he after? What's that dog guarding? Harry went to bed with his head buzzing with the same question. Neville was snoring loudly, but Harry couldn't sleep. He tried to empty his mind. He needed to sleep. He had to. He had his first Quidditch match in a few hours. But the expression on Snape's face when Harry had seen his leg wasn't easy to forget. The next morning dawned very bright and cold. The great hall was full of the delicious smell of fried sausages and the cheerful chatter of everyone looking forward to a good Quidditch match. You've got to eat some breakfast. I don't want anything. Just a bit of toast, wheedled Hermione. I'm not hungry. Harry felt terrible. In an hour's time, he'd be walking onto the pitch. Harry, you need your strength, said Seamus Finnegan. Seekers are always the ones who get nobbled by the other team. Mm, thanks, Seamus, said Harry, watching Seamus pile ketchup onto his sausages. By eleven o'clock, the whole school seemed to be out in the stands, around the Quidditch pitch. Many students had binoculars. The seats might be raised high in the air, but it was still difficult to see what was going on sometimes. Ron and Hermione joined Neville, Seamus and Dean, the West Ham fan, up in the top row. As a surprise for Harry, they had painted a large banner on one of the sheets Scabbers had ruined. It said, Potter for President, and Dean, who was good at drawing, had done a large Gryffindor line underneath. Then Hermione had performed a tricky little charm so that the paint flashed different colours. Meanwhile, in the changing rooms, Harry and the rest of the team were changing into their scarlet Quidditch robes. Slytherin would be playing in green. Wood cleared his throat for silence. (coughs) Okay, men, he said. And women, said Chaser Angelina Johnson. And women, Wood agreed. This is it. The big one, said Fred Weasley. The one we've all been waiting for, said George. We know all of his speech by heart, Fred told Harry. We were in the team last year. Oh, shut up, you two, said Wood. This is the best team Gryffindor's had in years. We're going to win. I know it. He glared at them all as if to say, or else. Right, it's time. Good luck, all of you. Harry followed Fred and George out of the changing room and, hoping his knees weren't going to give way, walked onto the pitch to loud cheers. Madame Hooch was refereeing. She stood in the middle of the pitch, waiting for the two teams, her broom in hand. Now, I want a nice, fair game, all of you, she said, once they were all gathered around her. Harry noticed that she seemed to be speaking particularly to the Slytherin captain, Marcus Flint a fifth year. Harry thought Flint looked as if he had some troll blood in him. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw the fluttering banner high above, flashing, Potter for president over the crowd. His heart skipped. He felt braver. Mount your brooms, please. Harry clambered onto his Nimbus 2000. Madame Hooch gave a loud blast on his silver whistle. Fifteen brooms rose up high, high into the air, and they were off and the quaffle is taken immediately by Angelina Johnson of Gryffindor. What an excellent chaser that girl is, and rather attractive too. Jordan! Sorry, Professor. (laughs) The Weasley twins' friend Lee Jordan was doing the commentary for the match, closely watched by Professor McGonagall. And she's really belting along up there, a neat pass to Alicia Spinnett, 
a good find of a little Oliver Woods. Last year, only a reserve. Back to Johnson and, oh no, Slytherin have taken the quaffle. Slytherin captain Marcus Flint gains the quaffle and off he goes. Flint flying like an eagle up there. He's going to, he's going to score? No. Stopped by an excellent move by Gryffindor keeper Wood and Gryffindor take the quaffle. That's Chasey, chaser Katie Bell of Gryffindor there. Nice dive around Flint. Off up the field and, ouch, that must have hurt. Hit in the back of the head by a bludger. Quaffle taken by Slytherin. That's Adrian Pusey speeding off towards the goalposts, but he's blocked by a second bludger. Sent his way by Fred or George Weasley. Can't tell which. Nice play by the Gryffindor beater. Anyway, and Johnson's back in possession of the Quaffle. A clear field ahead, and off she goes. She's really flying. Dodges a speeding bludger. The goalposts are ahead. Come on now, Angelina. Keeper Bletchley dives. Misses. Gryffindor scores. Gryffindor cheers filled the coal air with howls and moans from the Slytherins. Budge up there. Move along. Hagrid. Ron and Hermione squeeze together to give Hagrid enough space to join them. Been watching from me hut, said Hagrid, patting a large pair of binoculars around his neck. But it wasn't the same as being in the crowd. No sign of the snitch yet, eh? Nope, said Ron. Harry hasn't had much to do yet. Kept out of trouble, though. That's something, said Hagrid, raising his binoculars and peering skyward at the speck that was Harry. Way up above them, Harry was gliding over the game, squinting about for some sign of the snitch. This was part of his and Wood's game plan. Keep out of the way until you catch sight of the snitch, Wood had said. We don't want you attacked before you have to be. When Angelina had scored, Harry had done a couple of loop-the-loops to let out his feelings. Now he was back to staring around for the snitch. Once he caught sight of a flash of gold, but it was just a reflection from one of the Weasley's wristwatches. And once a bludger decided to come pelting his way, more like a cannonball than anything, but Harry dodged it and Fred Weasley came chasing after it. All right there, Harry, he had time to yell as he beat the bludger furiously towards Marcus Flint. Slytherin in possession, Lee Jordan was saying. Chaser Pusey ducks two bludgers, two Weasleys and Chaser Bell and speed towards the, wait a moment, was... Was that the snitch? A murmur ran through the crowd as Adrian Pusey dropped the quaffle, too busy looking over his shoulder at the flash of gold that had passed his left ear. Harry saw it. In a great rush of excitement, he dived downwards, after the streak of gold. Slytherin seeker Terence Higgs had seen it too. Neck and neck they hurtled towards the snitch. All the chasers seemed to have forgotten what they were supposed to be doing as they hung in midair to watch. Harry was faster than Higgs. He could see the little round ball wings fluttering, darting up ahead. He put on an extra spurt of speed. Wham! A roar of rage echoed from the Gryffindors below. Marcus Flint had blocked Harry on purpose, and Harry's broom spun off course, Harry holding on for dear life. Bow! screamed the Gryffindors. Madame Hooch spoke angrily to Flint and then ordered a free shot at the goalposts for Gryffindor. But in all the confusion, of course, the golden snitch had disappeared from sight again. I'll just show you the picture while there's a little. Mm, yeah, was... There was a little break. My pillow was looking away. Down in the stands, Dean Thomas was yelling, Send him off, ref! Red card! This isn't football, Dean, Ron Rum reminded him. You can't send people off in Quidditch. And what's a red card? But Hagrid was on Dean's side. They ought to change the rules. Flint could have knocked Harry out of the air. Lee Jordan was finding it difficult not to take sides. So, after that obvious and disgusting bit of cheating, Jordan, growled Professor McGonagall. I mean, after that open and revolting foul, Jordan, I'm warning you. All right, all right. Flint nearly kills the Gryffindor seeker, which could happen to anyone, I'm sure. So a penalty to Gryffindor takes by, taken by Spinnet, who puts it away no trouble, and we continue play. Gryffindor still in possession. It was as Harry dodged another bludger, which went spinning dangerously past his head, that it had happened. His broom gave a sudden, frightening lurch. For a split second, he thought he was going to fall. He gripped the broom tightly with both his hands and knees. He had never felt anything like that. It happened again. It was as though the broom was trying to buck him off. But Nimbus 2000s didn't suddenly decide to buck their riders off. Harry tried to turn back towards the Gryffindor goalposts. He had half a mind to ask Wood to call a timeout, and then he realised that his broom was completely out of his control. He couldn't turn it. 
He couldn't direct it at all. It was zigzagging through the air, and every now and then making violent swishing movements, which almost unseated him. Lee was still commentating. Slytherin in possession. Flint with the quaffle. Passes Spinet. Passes Bell. Hit hard in the face by a bludger. Hope it broke his nose. Only joking, Professor. Slytherin score. Oh, no. The Slytherins were cheering. No one seemed to have noticed that Harry's broom was behaving strangely. It was carrying him slowly higher, higher away from the game, jerking and twitching as it went. Don't know what Harry thinks he's doing, Hagrid mumbled. He stared through his binoculars. If I didn't know better, I'd say he's lost control of his broom. But he can't have. Suddenly, people were pointing up at Harry all over the stands. His broom had started to roll over and over, with him only just managing to hold on. Then the whole crowd gasped. Harry's broom had given a wild jerk, and Harry swung off it. He was now dangling from it, holding on with only one hand. Did something happen to it when Flint blocked him, Seamus whispered. Can't have, Hagrid said, his voice shaking. Can't nothing interfere with the broomstick, except powerful dark magic. No kid could do that to a Nimbus 2000. At these words, Hermione seized Hagrid's binoculars, but instead of looking up at Harry, she started looking frantically at the crowd. What are you doing, moaned Ron, grey-faced. I knew it, Hermione gasped. Snape, look. Ron grabbed the binoculars. Snape was in the middle of the stands opposite them. He had his eyes fixed on Harry and was muttering non-stop under his breath. He's doing something. Jinxing the broom, said Hermione. What should we do? Leave it to me. Before Ron could say another word, Hermione had disappeared. Ron turned the binoculars back on Harry. His broom was vibrating so hard, it was almost impossible for him to hang on much longer. The whole crowd were on their feet, watching, terrified as the Weasleys flew up, flew up to try and pull Harry safely onto one of their brooms. But it was no good. Every time they got near him, the broom would jump higher still. They dropped lower and circled beneath him, obviously hoping to catch him if he fell. Marcus Flint seized the quaffle and scored five times without anyone noticing. Oh, shit. Come on, Hermione, Ron muttered desperately. Hermione had fought her way across the stands to where Snape stood and was now racing along the row behind him. She didn't even stop to say sorry as she knocked Professor Quirrell headfirst into the row in front. <laughs> Reaching Snape, she crouched down, pulled out her wand and whispered a few well-chosen words. Bright blue flames shot from her wand on the hem of Snape's robes. It took perhaps 30 seconds for Snape to realise that he was on fire. A sudden yelp told her she had done her job. Scooping the fire off him into a little jar in her pocket, she scrambled back along the row. Snape would never know what had happened. It was enough. Harry was suddenly able to clamber back onto his broom. Neville, you can look, Ron said. Neville had been sobbing into Hagrid's jacket for the last five minutes. Harry was speeding towards the ground when the crowd saw him clap his hands to his mouth as though he was about to be sick. He hit the pitch on all fours, coughed, and something gold fell out, fell out of his hand. I've got the snitch, he shouted, waving it above his head, and the game ended in complete confusion. He didn't catch it. He nearly swallowed it. Flint was still howling 20 minutes later, but it made no difference. Harry hadn't broken any rules, and Lee Jordan was still happily shouting the result. Gryffindor had won by 170 points to 60. Harry heard none of this, though. He was being made a cup of strong tea back in Hagrid's hut with Ron and Hermione. It was Snape, Ron was explaining. Hermione and I saw him. He was cursing your broomstick, muttering. He couldn't take his eyes off you. Rubbish, said Hagrid, who hadn't heard a word of what had gone on next to him in the stands. Why would Snape do something like that? Harry, Ron and Hermione looked at each other, wondering what to tell him. Harry decided on the truth. I found out something about him, he told Hagrid. He tried to get past that three-headed dog at Halloween. It bit him. We think he was trying to steal whatever it's guarding. Hagrid dropped the teapot. How do you know about Fluffy, he said. Fluffy? <gasps> it's called Fluffy? Yeah. Did, it, did the book mention it before? That it was called Fluffy? No, this is the first time we get the name. You hear the name in the movie, too. I don't remember. I didn't remember it. Yeah, the That's dog's nice. name is Fluffy. It's even nicer than Sparky and Frankie Weenie. Mm. I'm gonna put 
Fluffy. Fluffy? My dog is called Fluffy, yeah. We'll get two dogs. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Fluffy? Yeah, he's mine. Bought him off a Greek chappie I met in the pub last year. I landed in a Dumbledore to guard the, uh... Yes, said Harry eagerly. Now don't ask me any more, said Hagrid gruffly. That's top secret, that is. But Snape's trying to steal it. Rubbish, said Hagrid again. Snape's a Hogwarts teacher. He'd do nothing of the sort. So why did he just try to kill Harry, cried Hermione. The afternoon's events certainly seem to have changed her mind about Snape. I know a jinx when I see one, Hagrid. I've read all about them. You've got to keep eye contact, and Snape wasn't blinking at all. I saw him. I'm telling you, you're wrong, said Hagrid hotly. I don't know why Harry's broom acted like that, but Snape wouldn't try and kill a student. Now listen to me, all three of you. You're meddling in things that don't concern you. It's dangerous. You forget that dog, and you forget about what it's guarding. That's between Professor Dumbledore and Nicholas Flamel. Aha, said Harry. So there's someone called Nicholas Flamel involved, is there? Hagrid looked furious with himself. Oh, that's it. The short chapter. That was, yeah. No, that's good. Yeah. Two short chapters in a row. Yeah. All right. Fluffy, cute. I mean, he's not really cute. You said you'd pet yeah, him. Yeah, I would pet any dog, though, so. I think they're cute. It's a cute name for a dog. Yeah. That very much isn't, a, you know, it's like calling a dog tiny when it's like. Big. <laughs> um. They got five points when the when mm, Harry off. was um getting murdered. <laughs> uh when they had the the Quidditch through the ages book mm. in the I don't know, outside outside the The library. The library. Yep. We have it outside the library. Yeah. Well, five points from Slytherin. And you're Ravenclaw. No, it's your book, though, so... okay, true. Yeah, it's you. Um, I remember that chapter. Um, you remember during, like, the peak of COVID when, um, when they, like, recorded these chapters? Yeah. This chapter was, uh, David Tennant and, uh, David Beckham. Mm -hmm. And they got the, like, Lee Jordan. Yeah. As David Beckham. Yeah. Yeah. You know, don't even watch this. Just go, just go listen to that chapter because it was good. I enjoyed listening to David Beckham read. I didn't completely. Listen you didn't read to that, that one. No. Okay, no, I enjoyed it. Though. I listened to it on the car when you put. Yeah, it. yeah, it's good for road trips. That, and by the time we get up to the second book, mm -hmm. then we'll be in you know fresh territory because I haven't seen anyone else do the book yet and, and the actual Pottermore people haven't done um, anything beyond the Chamber of Secrets yet mm. we have to wait for a minute Lima to make a book I'm sorry I mean yes. that could take years No, we started doing this and this book wasn't even out yet and we had to wait months yeah, I know. they're amazing Um, anything else from the chapter though no in particular no, no. Marcus Flint being uh, apparently having like part troll in his blood because he's did so not ugly. Get that. Remember the the Slytherin captain in the first movie? He's got like oh, yeah. the really bad teeth. Yeah. yeah, and like they've made him ugly on purpose. That's mm. because he like genuinely, mm. well, not genuinely. They're probably just making fun of him, and he mm. probably doesn't have blood in him that's troll. But um, also uh, Lee Jordan. He's been mentioned a few times already in the book, yeah. like at the very beginning, but he's like, he's Fred and George's muse, you know, like he's their, he's their sidekick. Really? He, yeah. Like, remember oh, they're wow. like, oh, you know, Lee Jordan, we think he's found this secret passage and he's super excited. Mm -hmm. And then they're like, oh, I bet you it's that one we've already found. He's like a lesser version of Fred and George. Mm -hmm. He um he's the one that's done the commentary and and you know he's saying Nazi stuff about Slytherin and Professor McGonagall's like Lee, like he's a bit of a he's a bit of a rogue as well. And in the movie he um I don't even know if that was supposed to be Lee Jordan in the movie or if they just got some random kid to oh. 
to do the commentary, but um, they pretty much just get a random student, like every time to do the commentary. In uh, in like other games, like they'll get Luna Lovegood mm. to do the commentary. They get some guy from Ravenclaw to do it, and everybody hates him. And they they just try and get somebody that's um. I suppose like not going to be biased, but at the same time, like Lee Jordan is in Gryffindor. I don't know why they would have gotten someone from Gryffindor to to yeah, do the. Co- yeah, actually, I might check. Maybe he's not in Gryffindor. I'm pretty sure he is. Yep, he's in Gryffindor. Mm. They made the sign, mm. and they like. I don't get the president part, but okay. I think just because um, it's like a muggle thing. I hope that focuses. It never actually focuses when I show the picture. But uh, yeah, I think they just think it's like a... wait for like a bit until it focuses. It's like a cute muggle thing. Like, oh, like they don't really know what it means. No. And like when Dean's like, red card, and like all the wizards are like, what? <laughs> What are you talking about red card but Hagrid who like probably doesn't really know much about Quidditch either is like yeah yeah give him a red card <laughs> send him off ref he's been doing it all day <sighs> they had uh, Madame Hooch do the refereeing even though she's like not really technically a teacher at the school she like she teaches the kids how to how to use broomsticks and stuff, like flying lessons, but she's not actually a professor. Yeah. Uh, she, for some reason, doesn't referee every game. Mm. She does this game, but, like, there are some games where Flitwick refs or Snape refs, and it's just it's whichever professor is available, generally. Mm. Which seems ridiculous to me that they'd have a teacher there specifically to teach flying. Yeah. Why would she not just be the ref all the yeah. time, you know? Like, does she, is she only, like, part-time? She might, like, be biased as well if she's, like, the teacher. She might like someone more. Yeah, I mean, she's bound to be far less biased than Snape or McGonagall. Yeah, true. Like, McGonagall wouldn't be biased at all because she's, yeah. she's, you know, very much that way. But, like, if Snape's refing, he's yeah. going to favour Slytherin, you know? True. Whereas, you know, if they have somebody on staff that's just for Quidditch. You know who as a Voldemort. Yeah. I don't think he'd really care about Quidditch. I think he'd just be zapping people out of the sky going, oh, I don't like you. <laughs> yeah, I'm just joking. But yeah, no. Because he hates everyone who won't be biased. <laughs> Do you think she's like an on call, like HPE teacher sort of thing? Yeah. And she only works like a couple weeks a semester. Maybe she just, you know, fun, just comes and goes magic, as she please. Yeah. yeah, maybe she's like a sub. She's a substitute teacher. Gets double the pay that the other teachers get. But hmm? just strolls on in, goes, right, oh, kids, first week, this is how you fly. Second week, goodbye. Yeah, bye. <laughs> she comes in for, like, the big games. Did you enjoy the Quidditch game? Yeah, it was all right. They, uh... They kind of did how Harry caught the snitch a bit differently. Like, he actually catches it. Um, but, like, he kind of catches the snitch before, he, like, his broom starts acting up. Yeah. And then it starts acting up, like, in the movie, and then he, like, recovers, and then he goes and catches the snitch. Yeah. Whereas in this, it's like, he had the snitch in his mouth the whole time. Oh, really? I didn't get that. Yeah. I thought he got it after. No, no, like, as soon as he recovers, like, he gets back in the broomstick and he flies to the ground and he goes, like, I got it. Oh, you know, okay. So. Mm. Is yeah. that it? Other than that, yeah, no, well, that chapter was called Quidditch and it had yep. a Quidditch match in it, so not really much else happened other than yep. Snake being a bit of a dick at the, the beginning of the game. Mm-hmm. Hermione setting him on fire, thanks to Hermione. Yeah, that was a bit different too, how Hermione set Snape on fire. Yeah. Like, instead of, like, actually legit setting him on fire, she used the same charm that they had in the jam jar in the courtyard. And, like, she lit him on fire, but then she, like, put it back in the jar, so he wasn't actually on fire. Like, it's less of a heinous crime against a teacher, I Mm. think. And, and like she like it says she knocked over Quirrell on her way mm. through so instead of instead of people getting up and going like oh Snape you're on fire and then knocking Quirrell over I mean Hermione just straight up just shoved the dude over mm. like in the book 
And that's why it seemed as if Harry, like, recovered super quick because Harry, you know, Hermione did, like, a left-right good night on Quirrell. Mm. Okay. She might have even, like, tagged the back of his head. She's, like, palmed Voldemort. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. And Harry trying to go into uh, Snape's office mm. and seeing, like, uh, Filch, like, bandaging him up. And how, how Is Filch... That important? It's not in the movie, basically. Yeah, but... I think it kind of... It lets you know that Filch is kind of a Slytherin confidant, I suppose. Okay. Like, Filch wouldn't do that for, you know, Professor McGonagall. Mm -hmm. Why didn't, uh... Why didn't Snape go to, uh, Madame Pomfrey to get healed up? She could have healed it up real quick. Why did... Why did he go to Filch? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I think that is an interesting question. Actually, I've never thought of that. Why? Why did he go to the squib, the guy that can't do I any magic? That people would help each other. Or they don't have to be like. Um... I would be willing. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> no, our cameras actually already clicked off. Yeah. It's just audio now. <laughs> You're just talking to yeah, pretty much. No, we are pretty much done though. What was I just saying? I said, like, I thought teachers can help each other. That's not really important. That's what I thought about it. Still, you think they'd go to Madame Pomfrey, who, like, can heal, like, broken bones in, like, a second. Mm. But it wasn't a broken bone. It was just bleeding. I would have gone to Madame Pomfrey. (laughs) I don't even know who Madame Pomfrey is now. She's, like, the medic. Every time they go to the hospital, there's that lady that goes, oh, get okay. out, uh, get out of here. Okay, yeah. Um, Maybe she wasn't there. Yeah. Maybe her and, uh, her and, what's her name? Madam Hooch, like, swap. Maybe they're the same person. Madam Hooch and Madam Pomfrey mm-hmm. are the same person. There you go. <laughs> there's a there's a thinker to finish on. Yes. That'll do. Okay. Thank you guys for watching. Like and subscribe. Thank you. See you later, guys. <laughs> yeah, there's no video for like the last 10 minutes. <laughs>